A happy staff makes a happy environment. I get rid of the bad apples quick and effectively. I fire lots of people, don't get me wrong, because if they have a bad attitude and they're not, you know, generating a positive environment to, yeah. you know, help the staff member stay in a positive mode, you know, I get rid of that bad apple as, as quick as possible. I take their biggest and hardest problem customers and headaches. I would let me have them. If I allow this customer to rattle you at the beginning of your shift, the rest of your shift is going to be crap. You're going to produce low dollar per customer averages. My customers are going to be, you know, upset with the level of service. So why allow my staff member to be entangled with a bad customer? when I can take that off their hands. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. In my business, we had problem customers from time to time. I think every business, restaurants included, hotels included, occasionally have customers that are disgruntled for a variety of reasons. Maybe they've had too much to drink. Maybe they just are complainers. But we all have to deal with this, and it can be a problem. The number one thing is not disrupting other guests' experiences, not creating an unsafe environment. So with me today is Mr. Adam Evans, and he's a former bar manager, general manager, bar owner, um, entertainment promoter. He's seen it all, and he's written a new book called The Customer Is Not Always Right. So you're not going to want to miss this episode. We give specific examples about how to deal with the problem customer and how to kind of head it off at the pass before it even happens. So you want to stay tuned to this episode. I also want to tell you a little bit about the Restaurant Rockstars Academy. It is so important to train your staff, not only to serve and sell, it's so important to dial in your critical financial numbers, really understand them and really know what your prime costs are, what your daily break even is, and then marketing that's trackable, that isn't just spending money out the window just hoping for the best. So the Restaurant Rockstars Academy is a complete training tool that teaches you all of those things. And the best part is you can assign any of the training modules to any of your team members within your property. And that's an exit strategy. So check that out at restaurantrockstars.com. I'd like to thank the sponsors of this week's episode, Works, The Birthday Club, Smithfield Culinary, and of course, Restaurant Rockstars Academy. Okay, on with the episode. You're tuned in to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. Powerful ideas to rock your restaurant. Here's your host, Roger Bodwin. At Smithfield, they know that to meet lovers, a great serving of their favorite cut is so much more than just food. It's an experience, one that keeps them coming back to your operation again and again. They're committed to offering you the perfect protein for every dish at each day part. Turn to Smithfield for the most comprehensive portfolio of pork products, such as bacon, ham, sausage, and more, plus a variety of fully cooked beef and chicken. With Smithfield products, you can create delicious meals from traditional menu items to globally inspired dishes, all designed to satisfy the insatiable appetites of your hungry carnivorous patrons. What's more, Smithfield does it responsibly with full transparency and traceability from their farms to your kitchen. You can always be confident that when you partner with Smithfield, you'll serve what you love and your customers will love what you serve. Find your perfect protein with Smithfield. For more information or to order products, visit smithfieldculinary.com slash smithfield. People go to restaurants for lots of reasons, for fun, celebration, for family, for lifestyle. What the customer doesn't know is the thousands of details it takes to run a great restaurant. This is a high risk, high fail business. It's hard to find great staff. Costs are rising and profits are disappearing. It's a treacherous road and smart operators need a professional guide. I'm Roger. I've started many highly successful, high profit restaurants that I've now sold for millions of dollars. I'm passionate about helping other owners and managers not just succeed, but knock it out of the park. I created a game changing system and it's filled with everything I've learned in over 20 years running super profitable, super fun restaurants. Everything from creating high profit menu items and cost controls to staff training where your team serve and sell, to marketing hooks, money maximizing tips, and efficiencies across your operation. What does this mean to you? More money to invest in your restaurant, to hire a management team, time freedom, and peace of mind. 
You don't just want to run a restaurant. You want to dominate your competition and create a lasting legacy. Join the Academy and I'll show you how it's done. Hey, welcome back, everyone. This is the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. So, Adam, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. I'm, you know, again, I love talking to high energy, you know, hospitality people. It's a fun business and uh, you've got a lot of experience and I want to talk all about that. But everyone begins somewhere. Everyone's got their own hospitality story. Where did yours begin? Yeah. So um, my hospitality experience and journey has, has come from a multiple of angles. Uh, we mentioned before uh, the interview uh, about my breakfast cafe that I created in college. And uh, that was a good start, but I kind of had a bad taste in my mouth from that and uh, was not necessarily interested in joining hospitality after that field. And I've always been in the entertainment space of bars and restaurants and nightclubs. And the more and more uh, parties and events that I threw across multiple venues I really gained a, an incredible following of people that enjoyed what we had to offer and, and what we provided to our customers. And as we grew and scaled, I noticed that a lot of these larger operations no longer cared about the hospitality. And my customers were getting stiffed over and over and uh, waiting 30, 45 minutes for drinks and had bad experiences. And it was my marketing and advertising and promotion that brought these people here and when they didn't get the hospitality they deserved, they held me accountable personally, mm. even though I would the middle. most of the time at the beginning of my career just rent somebody else's facility for parties and events. And so that that really forced me to try and take a more active role in the operation or to control the operation when I took a rental because I I no longer wanted my customers to receive poor customer service. And when you're standing on stage with the entertainment and you're providing the fun and the atmosphere and you're doing the hard part by getting people here and keeping them for long periods of time and the establishment isn't doing their job when it comes to collecting them the revenue that's inside the building already. I mean, uh, you know, I just got tired of watching establishments fail and my customers just be disappointed and I had to take a more active role. So how did you get into the entertainment space and, you know, being a promoter? Cause that's a really dynamic thing. And you can, you can, you know, you can have small regional clubs that you bring acts to, you can literally be the promoter putting the Rolling Stones in the biggest arenas in the world. It's like a fascinating field. How did you get into that? And tell us some of the acts that you were working with and, and some of your experiences there. That's, that's interesting stuff. Yeah. So, um, in, uh, 2002, I started a uh, music entertainment magazine in Fort Myers. Okay. And, yeah. uh, I, you know, I come from a, like a graphics design background and uh, media background. So there we go. Uh, you know, fresh out of uh, Cypress Lake Center for the Arts, I started this music publication. I printed 5,000 copies monthly from the Fort Myers News Press, did my printing, and uh, I would pass them all out for free at the end of club nights. Uh, to people and events and and we called it street smart distribution because we would hand them go hand to hand to the people that are in this scene and in that lifestyle and uh, as advertisers were buying ads in my uh, publication they noticed that i was also putting in the work to do you know the promotion and the marketing and uh, i was really young at that time so i mean i took the photographs i did the you know um, i had a a very well-known guy now uh, become the director of my marketing. Uh, so the publication was called 239 Magazine. It's when uh, Fort Myers switched from 941 area code to 239. And uh, Ronnell Lavette was the director of my marketing. He's uh, Mr. Big Gates, which is Plies' brother, helped launch Plies the rapper's career. Oh, um, he, awesome. he really helped me with my marketing and my publication. Mm -hmm. And, and um, uh, because he was throwing shows, in concerts all the time anyway and he was also the director of my marketing he would team the magazine and publication up with the events and i would help him you know with the promotions and the other side and so really early on before big gates records got their start uh, i did a lot of stuff with them uh, and as far as events and as they kind of grew and left my market i kind of picked up their void a little bit 
So spending a lot of time in these entertainment venues, bars, selling alcohol and that sort of thing, did you see opportunity there? Because you then went on to, to, you know, to found bars and stuff and you were bar owner. Like, was that the connection, the, the initial start so, to it? So for me, the, it's always been the love of music, you know, that kind of yeah. led to okay. that. And, um, yep. you know, I kind of tell people, I joke around that, uh, you know, had I known a passion for music would made me an alcohol salesman for life, I may have reconsidered you know, my, my love affair, but, um, you know, that goes hand in hand, you know, in order to pay and provide for the entertainment, you have to sell food or drinks to justify the expense because certainly price alone doesn't cover it most of the time. And if it does, uh, you know, the margin is small, as you know, so you, you have to, to be able to capitalize your income is in as many different ways as possible to, to cover the expense. And when I first started throwing shows and events, you could get high quality artists for five and ten thousand dollars. Now these guys want twenty five, fifty, hundred thousand dollars for wow, artists no that kidding. are not even quality. And so, yeah, uh, you no know, kidding. their ego and their pride uh, makes them demand a dollar mm -hmm. amount that I I think is unrealistic with business because you know an operation can only generate so many dollars. You know, when it's maximized, if my capacity is a thousand people, yes. And, you know, my average customer, including admission, is forty dollars a customer. You know, I can't book a forty or fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollar rack. Yeah, the numbers just don't work. It just doesn't, exactly, it doesn't work. So, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I think the amount of artists now that are demanding a price outside of their ability to fill the venue is is grown exponentially, and venue operators are really getting you know their their ass handed to them. When it comes to a lot of these bookings, if they're not really in touch with, you know, trends and and what's going on, and it's it's an ever evolving thing to be a part of. Yeah, I was part of that for a while too. Uh, my biggest restaurant did live entertainment, and that was just another profit center, and we were able to make the numbers work. Uh, well, first of all, we did acoustic musicians quite a bit, and you know, we'd pay three, four hundred bucks for a couple hours, and this guy would like play everything from you know Cat Stevens, the Beatles music, the stuff that everyone wants to hear. No, that's a winning formula because it's non-threatening. It's a nice yeah. relaxing atmosphere. You don't got to hire twenty extra security guys. Yes, no security for that. But then on weekends, Fridays, Saturdays, we'd have bar bands that would come in, and then yes, we needed a security team and all that, and we'd charge cover at the door. And our biggest shows would be twenty bucks at the door. Most shows would be ten dollars at the door. But we'd get two, three hundred people in there, and the band would charge us fifteen hundred dollars, and we'd make money on the cover. But then we'd sell a ton of alcohol. It was a totally winning formula. But Absolutely. it wasn't at the kind of you know the the big leagues you were playing in with some of these bigger, bigger acts and stuff. Certainly, but on a smaller scale you know yeah, we, and I, I tried to downsize from you know when when a lot of these acts you know it used to be if you had one hit song on the radio you were never going to be more than ten thousand dollars you know now these guys have one song and they want forty thousand dollars out of the gate it's just absolutely unrealistic so uh that's why i purchased a smaller bar in ebor and went away from from giant concert promotions for a while mm -hmm. and okay. i stayed at that kind of thousand dollar band level for a while and we did really well and and uh when during the pandemic we sold that location and uh, we're waiting for real estate prices to come down and we're going yeah. to, to okay and for sure because now you've got a consulting firm and staffing and all that for hospitality we'll get into that in a moment but i'm still interested in some of your bar experiences because yeah. because that probably is the segue to the book we're going to talk about you know Absolutely. the customer is not always right which is yeah there's a little paradigm shift there and i like the name of the title it says it all it's great but is that, you know, some of your experiences, because you've been a general manager for a long, long time in hospitality, your bar owner, and obviously you've got a million stories to tell, and the bad customer enters into some of these stories, as they did for me. So let's let's get back to the bars for a moment. You were in that for quite some time, and, you know, there were challenges in running bars. It was a profitable thing to do. But then did you need security teams and did you have bad customers and you had bar fights like we did when we first started? Like, I, yeah, all that stuff went on. Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, what I do very effectively now is mitigate risk. And uh, okay. you know, just um, because of my length of experience in, in doing these types of things. So uh, I'm very blessed to be able to, you know, bring in a thousand or two thousand people, you know, in an environment that might be a little rowdy sometimes and everybody leaves safe 
without any issues and incidents. And and it's a lot of checks and balances, a lot of redundancy, a lot of focusing on every nickel. And and uh, you know, as long as you're prepared, you won't be surprised for the most part. And I, you know, that's where a lot of these larger operations fail. I think is because you know either they underestimate what the promoter's telling them because most promoters are liars and they're like, oh, I'm going to bring a million people here. Of course. You know, so, yeah. Um, you know, they do need to do their own research and due diligence to make sure they're prepared for what size, you know, show is coming and, and what, you know, what caliber of customer, you know, uh, an Elton John show is going to bring you one style of customer, you know, where, you know, a uh, Rick Ross show is going to necessarily bring you a different customer. And so, you know, I would staff both of those differently. I would uh, stock those bars with different alcohol i would you know have different security companies work both of those types of concerts and this might be the same venue doing one show one week and another show next week you have to have the uh the versatility to to understand how to be prepared for each each show you know if i'm doing a uh, a death metal show you know i'm going to probably even book a completely different security team and have a lot of the same protocols that i will for a rick ross show you know just we're going to be serving, you know, more Jack Daniels and we got to prepare for that versus yeah, that you know, sense. some of the other alcohol. So, um, you know, if you're in a venue that has the same clientele over and over and over again, it makes it easy because you can stock your liquor pretty easily, your food stuff pretty easily, you know, but um, most venues in today's environment have to provide different styles of entertainment in order to be successful. Even, you know, giant bars that are rock bars or country bars still have a hip hop night or a top 40 night or an alternative lifestyle night. And, you know, it's, it's staffed differently. You know, you mentioned earlier about bad service or waiting a long time at a bar and that brought up a, a, an experience that happened to me. So we here in the Northeast are kind of big skiers and we go to the ski resort every weekend and there's a bar right on the slopes that's really popular and they've got a big rectangular bar in the middle of the room. They've got six bar service stations there and this particular day, I mean, they had a great band playing. That's why we went. We know the band. It's an 80s act that we like to follow. It's a lot of fun. Anyway, I waited 25 minutes for a drink and every one of those bar stations had a line 10, 15 people back and obviously these bartenders didn't have time to be very personable to the guests. They're just slinging drinks as fast as they can, but they're like favoring certain people. And even though I'm in front of this person, they're missing me and they're serving this person. And I'm watching this happen at multi stations for 25 minutes. And it's like, they didn't have any satellite bars set up that would sell quick beers. Like, here you go. And none of that was happening. And you know, you just got to wonder, it's like, yes, busy bars happen, but the service aspect still must be there and you still must interact with the guests besides just slinging the drinks. I know it's all about profit and moving the merchandise, but again, people were getting bad service around that whole bar and I watched it happen and I literally stood there because I was a captive audience. You know, I don't know what the key is to that. It's like other than the satellite bars and training your staff better, but it's kind of disappointing because maybe people in bars are a little bit more um, tolerant of bad service versus restaurant service where you expect Absolutely. a high level service, you know, but I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but I just thought I'd mention it because it came up in conversation. No, that's, that's a great point. You know, I, uh, I've operated a ton of places that don't serve food and you can fumble the ball and make all kinds of mistakes. But if you serve food, they hold you accountable for every single thing, every yeah. single dish. You know, and uh, restaurants are held to a much higher level of scrutiny and even bars that serve food than than a bar that does not. And, right. um, you know, which there's no reason for that. And uh, for me, the hospitality is the win because that's what separates me from so many other bars and restaurants that have been open longer than than places that I own or operate is Thank you. customer yep. comes to me. I I literally give them what they've been missing at every other establishment. And uh, I'm able to do that because bartenders would say that I overstock or overstaff the bar with bartenders, okay? Or sometimes I overstaff the floor with servers. I might only give, you know, three or four tables to a server. But I feel like that's the that's what's important in order for you to have the type of hospitality experience that you deserve and mm -hmm. what you're paying for, especially in these elevated price environments. So, yeah. Um, and if a bartender or a server is good, 
four tables is all they need if they're turning them properly and effectively, especially with check sizes of, you know, two, three, four hundred dollars. I mean, they should be able to turn those three or four tables very fast and very well and effectively provide amazing customer service and do that three or four times and not have to serve 80 tables a night in order to make the same money. You know, in a bartender for me, you know, uh, I'm very blessed right now. My bar staff is amazing and uh, I can't praise them or thank them as much as as I want to or should uh in hopes that they don't get complacent but you know they're <laughs> sure. turning in 65 to 100 dollar customer average for me every night after night after night sweet you know, and they have to because yeah. by me putting extra bartenders on you now are forced to engage and interact with a fewer number of people creating better quality customer service creating higher ticket averages, creating bigger tips, creating relationships with customers that last forever. So I can be a cheap boss and try to save payroll at a reduced wage by only putting one bartender on, or I can stack it full of bartenders and servers and may the strongest survive. <laughs> Beautiful. I am so appreciative that you shared that comment because again, there are those that um, have limited thinking. And again, they're thinking about a cost, not an investment, an investment in better service, like you said, and cost effectively your servers and your bartenders on an hour per hour basis are generating tons of money for you while providing this better service. So it's kind of short sighted to look at it like, oh, I'm just going to put one bartender on or I'll slam that server. And so many restaurants do that. And we've all been out to experiences where that happens more often than not when yeah. it need not as long yeah, as you, you, know, know, you can staff people yeah with the, with the staffing you know issues right now people are a little right. bit more tolerant of it but even when there's not mm, a staffing yeah. crisis it's it's very prevalent you know and especially yeah. especially in the bar scene you know it's um which that's that's where all the profit is. So there's no reason you should short staff your bar. So absolutely, uh, it's it's a huge insight that most operators and owners are really just missing the boat on. Tell us about your general manager experience, because that's about 20 years of experience. And obviously, you've worked in a variety of places, or maybe you, you spent a long period of time at one or two places. But what were your experiences like? And what what qualities and skill sets and approach is most important to be an effective GM in a place that's a, a high volume restaurant and or bar? Well, what makes me very effective and different than a lot of my old school counterparts is I focus on the staff. A happy staff makes a happy environment. I mm -hmm. get rid of the bad apples quick and effectively. I fire lots of people. Don't get me wrong, because if they have a bad attitude and they're not, you know, generating a positive environment to yeah. you know help the staff members stay in a positive mode you know i get rid of that bad apple as, as quick as possible but um i let my staff have whenever, whenever they want off i let them have it unless i can't avoid it and then i call and beg them hey listen i have this event and i really really need you if you can figure out a way to you know instead of the old school approach when i first got into operating is this is the schedule and you better be here for your shift no i'm i'd be flexibility as Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and, um, you know, and I do that for any staff member, whether they've been with me for a long time or whether they've been with me for a short time. And I make sure that, you know, uh, I take their biggest and hardest problem customers and headaches. I would let me have them because I have the experience to deal with them anyway. And if I allow this customer to rattle you at the beginning of your shift, the rest of your shift is going to be crap. You're going to produce low dollar per customer averages. My customers are going to be, you know, upset with the level of service. So why allow my staff member to be entangled with a bad customer when I can take that off their hands? It might suck, but that co that employee then stays productive for eight hours instead of the last seven hours of their shift being crap because they had to deal with a bad customer. So, so I make sure that I take the lead on that. And I'm, I take the lead on uh, a, a lot of things by example, showing them that, you know, no matter how crappy the job is, you know, I'll jump in there with them and we will get it figured out or I'll provide them with enough resources so that they can win. And I, and that's what really separates me is tell me what tools you need to do this effectively and I'll get them for you. But at that same time, I'm going to then hold you accountable to do those things because I provided you now the tools you said you needed. So it's give and take. It is for sure. And you, you mentioned several things there. So the leadership, obviously leadership by example 
came crystal clear. That's super important. The flexibility, the respect for their outside lives. And if you give, then you can get. And chances are, if you take care of them when you really need something, they're going to back you as well if they're the right people. And also Absolutely. getting rid of the C players. I've never, but yeah, so I've never actually called somebody and said, that, you know, hey, can you be here for this event? And them not be able to to follow through or or come through, you know, unless they were out of the country or something crazy, you know, they they'll rearrange my schedule. But at the same time, mm -hmm. I also have a large number of staff members, especially by doing this for so many years, that if I know ahead of time, I can call and get the get the shift filled. So it you know there it's a general manager or operator that doesn't have a lot of resources is going to to demand that you be there on shifts because he doesn't have other people he can call. Restaurant owners and managers, listen, it's not too late to claim your employer retention credit, but you have to act soon. If you haven't heard of this, your business can receive money back from the IRS, money you've already paid in payroll taxes. Nothing you do today is more important. Now, this is free and clear cash that your business is owed by the government. The ERC program is available if your operation had 500 employees or less. You had to shut down or partially suspend your business, or you had at least a 20% decrease in business due to COVID-19 during any quarter of 2020 and the first three quarters of 2021. Now, your business can get up to $7,000 per employee per quarter for 21 and up to $5,000 per employee in 2020. Now, if you have just 10 employees today and meet the requirements, you can receive up to $260,000 back in a refundable tax credit that you don't have to pay back. Now, the faster you apply, the quicker you get the money, but you must do it soon. You can use the money for any purpose, payroll, cost of goods, business improvement, or other expenses expenses. Again, you don't have to pay this money back. Now, Works is a company that will do everything for you to get the money that you're owed. Now, I'm speaking from experience with Works. My restaurant received big checks in all available quarters, and Works people and process made it easy. For a no-obligation consultation, click the link in the show notes to this episode and speak to them with no obligation. You pay nothing until they get you the cash. Act now. I also like that word accountability, which is critically important. People have to know what their what your expectations are, what they're expected to bring to the table to be, you know, optimum performers, what type of service and hospitality they're supposed to deliver, productivity, all those things are super important. So if you've got a method of accountability and by the way you lead by example, that's a really powerful formula also. So I'm glad you brought that up. Let's talk about You've developed some pretty effective sales training techniques or staff training per se. Can we speak to that? Yeah. So, um, you know, let's take the example uh, about the triangle bar that you had. Okay. So in that environment, if I knew that I was going to be understaffed and we were going to be rocking, for an example, uh, I would sell every single drink as doubles. Okay. Yes. I was, uh, you know, yeah. Would you care for a double? Uh, don't wait in line again. And yeah. Okay. Yeah, or not Keep even the option. Just boom. Here it is. Here's yeah, your and charge I them for it. A, I gave you a double because yeah. you had to wait so long. So, you know, it's um, um, an interesting perspective. But, you know, each each thing that you come across is absolutely different, you know, as far as um, what it is you're trying to train the staff to do. If you're trying to train the staff in a restaurant environment, you're obviously not trying to get the tables wasted. So you're upselling appetizers. Yeah, that's you know, true. You're, you're upselling uh, high end, you know, uh, martinis or margaritas that you can get 15, 16, 18 dollars out of because, you know, you've got beautiful garnishes and they're not necessarily going to get 10 of those, you know, where if you're in an bar environment, you know, your specials are going to be different because they're going to be there with for a long period of time drinking and interacting and and uh, one thing that I do is um, I offset my specials. So uh, if I'm providing you with an amazing deal on alcohol, I'm not discounting the food. And then if I'm providing you with an amazing food deal, I'm not discounting the alcohol. You know, so depending on, you know, what the driver is. And then I use those things to be able to try and upsell. Uh, for an example, if somebody orders a Corona, we're going to ask them if they would like a loaded Corona. And we can put some Bacardi in the top of that. So, I mean, we're going to come up with, 
different ideas, different drinks, different combinations based on your location, the types of customers that you have to make sure that we we tailor an upselling technique that that fits your needs. So, you know, that that brought up another memory I had of a profitability and analysis where I used to go to this other bar at another ski resort in Vermont and they didn't serve draft beer because they figured out that even though draft beer is more profitable than bottled beer, they could serve like three or four bottles at the same time it would take to pour a draft. You know, it's like, okay, there's so many magic formulas in this business to really optimize service, not only from not keeping people waiting, but really maximizing the number of people you can serve and still making money. And that's and have, super interesting. And you have to look at the metrics for each location, you know, um, mm -hmm. because what works well for, you know, one location that has that type of volume, another location that doesn't have that type of volume where they don't need to serve that many beers in an right. hour. Mm hmm you know, they are going to be better off with the draft system. You know, I, uh, I had a uh, location in Ybor city that was, that had 40 beers on tap. And, uh, as the local craft beer craze started to switch to the seltzer craze, I slowly switched yeah, that from right. 40 beers to 20 yeah. and down to 10. And, uh, you know, uh, we only keep eight to 10 draft beers now because, you know, I feel like personally the seltzer beer craze kind of killed the draft, the the craft beer craze a little bit. Do you think that has legs? I mean, you're talking about a trend that's hot right now. It's been hot for a while. And I think it started with like hard ciders and, you know, twisted tea and Mike's lemonade and all those, you know, those specialty drinks. And then it suddenly hit the white claws and the seltzers and the beer seltzers and all that kind of stuff. And there's an endless variety of products you can sell in a bar and some things come and go and some things really last a long time. Do you see the seltzer craze continuing? Well, right now we're selling a ton of high noon and we're not selling any white claw like we used to. Uh -huh. We used to sell a gazillion cases of white claw. Uh, but that was also when they were like the first. Yeah. Also kind of sure. like first rollout. Yeah. Crazy marketing going on. That wasn't even affiliated with them. They had some comedians that, that uh, made some parodies of their drink that really just kind of helped them take off. Um, and we threw some really fun white claw parties early in, and when it first started coming out, uh, you know, and I think part of that is because we're ahead of the trends. Um, now we, I just did my order. I ordered one case of variety, um, you know, where I ordered 10 cases of high noon. So, um, but I, I anticipate the high noon to fade out. Yeah. And you got to well. be on top of it and know when things are going to shift, obviously. So you're not sitting on inventory, obviously on open cases, you can send back to your distributor, but still always being progressive and proactive and knowing when a trend is probably dying out and then be ready with the next big thing to roll out to your guests. You know, that's, I'm sure that's what sounds like you're totally on top of all the time. Yeah, that's, um, and it, <laughs> I ask myself this question all the time is how am I so on top of the trends? Cause that is something that I am very on top of, you know, and, uh, as I get older, I wonder how I'm able to stay on top of the trends. When I was younger, as a young operator, it was easy because I was like, oh, this is. You were the customer too, right? Product. You were like exactly. in the forefront you know, of it all. Yeah. Um, you know, now there's a 20 year gap between me and my customers. And yet I'm I'm still blessed to kind of see the trends coming and, and stay on top of those. And, you know, being able to be flexible, um, you know, your staff knows the trends. Yes, they but do. Just by having a good relationship with your staff, yeah. they know. They yeah. know what's coming. You know, if they say, get this liquor, get it. You know what I mean? Why not? They've had lots of requests for it. They think it's hot. They see it out when they're out and about in other places. It's like, yeah, they got an eye for this stuff. You're, you're absolutely right. Okay. Involve your team and, mm -hmm. and yeah, ask them. Or a couple of bottles. So what if it doesn't work? Put it on $2 yeah. special for happy hour, blow and it blow out. Blow it out. Yeah. Then, yeah. Uh, one failed trend, for an example, Empress huh? Gin. Uh, was super hot on TikTok, this purple gin. Okay. I ordered a couple bottles. It's absolutely horrible. Nobody wants it. Okay. Where does it come from? Um I uh I think I ordered from Southern Wine of Spirits, but I don't know I don't know the major brand or anything okay, behind I, it. Yeah. I wasn't even Never. familiar with that, but you said it's purple. It's it's a purple bottle of gin. It yeah, comes yeah. out purple. Um oh wow okay. on TikTok. Yeah. The staff showed me the TikToks, talked to me about it. I bought a couple of bottles, even though in my heart, I didn't think that it would catch on. Mm -hmm. um, but I still have those same couple of bottles with the 
exception of the one or two drinks the staff wanted to taste, you know? So, yeah. But that's an example of a failed trend. You know, high noon was a win. One of my bartenders talked to me about high noon and um, she's a fraternity girl. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was just like, um, nobody's drinking White Claw anymore. Everybody's drinking high noon. And I bought it and we sold out the first week. And, you know, part of me, I think, is because she was pushing it. But so what? If that's what your bartender wants to push, order the product. Right. Sure. You know, excellent advice. Let's talk about Bar Almighty. How did it start? What is it? What do you do? What are your specialties? And I like the name. Yeah. So Bar Almighty kind of, um, it started really on accident. I had to name it. Um, I have a ton of requests from other owners and operators that always want plug and play bartenders or servers at the last minute. Uh, because, you Mm -hmm. know, I throw a lot of parties. I know a lot of people. I've got a bunch of email lists and, you know, party lists and and employee lists. You know, I, uh, do big events sometimes where I need 50 people and small events where I need three. So, so they contact me a lot for, for last minute staff. And, uh, I never charged anybody for it ever for a decade. And I just, um, goodwill, huh? Well, just, it started as, you know, I just wanted favors when I needed a favor, you know, sure, 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 sure. cups. I I now have somebody I can call and go get cups from if my bag in the box broke and it, poured out my last bag in the box of Coke all over the floor. And I still have a room full of people and I need to go somewhere and get it. I now have somebody that I can go and get it from. So it really just yeah. kind of started out was like the network. Uh, yep. I just wanted to increase my network and my value. And, and mm-hmm. uh, it really snowballed to where I just started putting people together in their own online group. And now I've got some online groups that hire thousands and thousands of people, you know, every year, right from my own networking group. And, um, uh, I still don't even take a piece of the action on that. And we're just now starting to focus on full-time placement for, you know, general managers and chefs uh, and high level hospitality people. Um, The short-term staffing stuff is uh, not even something that we're really going after hardcore. It's just my existing network of people that have needed staff for a long period of time. We're starting to monetize it and, and, give it some formal structure, um, you know, and, and part of my part of my exit strategy from the late night bar and nightclub and restaurant business. Uh-huh. You know, yep. and, uh, Can't be there uh, till 3 a.m. anymore. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I don't have too many 3 a.m., 4 a.m. nights uh, these days, but I still have two or two or three a week, but it's a lot different than six a week is what it yeah, I hear you. Yeah, I retired from that a long time ago, but I remember <laughs> being the last person to close up after the band has to pack up their gear for two hours after they played a four-hour show. It's like, oh my God, hurry it up. Get out of here. Load that van and cruise. So, so I, I ran a place called the Ebor City Jazz House, which was mm-hmm. a, an amazing place. It was uh, one of my favorite buildings to operate because of the live music it was just so amazing and and some of the bands we had. But same same scenario, you know, the... Uh, uh, on their last, we would try to get it. So they played all weekend, but a lot of times we weren't able to do that. So, you know, last person waiting for them to, of course, undo all their gear and nice. <laughs> be excessive. So, well, that's cool. I mean, you're diverse, you know, very diverse skill set and diverse series of experiences. So now you're an author and, uh, this is yep. really interesting. And obviously it's, it's just many, many, many years of experiences that gave you the material to write this book. And it's called the customer is not always right. So again, the title's great. Tell us about the brainchild for that and tell us about what we learn and how we can apply the information. Yeah. So, um, it's a little tricky because it makes it sound like, you know, we're not interested in the majority of customers, but that's really the opposite case. Uh, we're looking for the customer that is a problem customer, the one that's definitely not right, the one that's breaking all the rules per se, um, and minimize his exposure to the quality guests, minimize his exposure to our environment, minimize his exposure to our uh, staff, and uh, try to find ways to keep them from even coming back and, and entertaining your establishment. And you can do that through a wide, uh, wide variety of different things from you know uh, the types of food that you sell, the types of drinks that you offer, the drink specials that you have, the, you know, interior, the environment, the music playing, the um, dress code at the door. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily give you all the secrets, but it it's uh, 
there's some really good information in there. And uh, when my kids started to get a little older, I wanted to uh, start formulating as much information as possible so they didn't just see me as a, you know, uh, bar, restaurant, and nightclub operator. I wanted them to know that uh, there's so much more to me than that. And the only way to do that is to put it down on paper. So uh, for years, I just recorded random thoughts as they happened. I recorded, uh, you know, random experiences as as I would come across them. And I literally just would open my Google Drive and I would hit voice record and I would just talk. And then, um, you know, a few years ago, I started formulating those into, you know, complete sentences or or complete paragraphs and thoughts and grouping them together. And the book that I kind of first created, the, the rough outline was probably about three or four times bigger than the book that I released. And uh, I just thought it was important to kind of separate the thought processes into smaller individual books so that, um, you know, it wasn't like one r- giant run on sentence. When you're trying to talk to owners and operators, it can get very boring. You know, the stuff that you have, the information that you have, although the information is very valuable, it's very intense, uh, you know, lots of examples. But if this isn't your niche, it can get boring. You know, if you're not a restaurateur that gets excited about learning how to increase your profit, (laughs) it sounds like a boring topic. So uh, I took the first book and I took all these ideas that I had and I uh, screenshot people that are inside my own hiring groups that were complaining and talking about the same things. So I took a little bit from random bartenders, owners, and operators that publish inside my own groups now their thoughts and stuff about the industry. And I correlated that with with the things that I was talking about in the book to try and give it some examples. You know, um, one thing that I gave many examples of is uh, the illusion of extra ice inside your drink. Okay. Most people think that a drink packed full of top of all the way to the top full of ice is watered down. When in reality, that makes the drink stronger because I'm only able to use a little bit of cranberry or a little bit of Coke because there's no room. Good point. Absolutely. most, Most people, when they see lots of ice, they think you're watering their drink down. When in reality, if you use only a little bit of ice, then half the cup is cranberry juice and they're Mm -hmm. going to complain regardless. So, um, you know, and I took a bunch of those examples. I put the, uh, you know, customers and bartenders complaining about customers that did this. And then I kind of broke down why it's like that, the science behind it and why it's important that you do it this way. And, and, um, you know, there's certain establishments that you run into where every drink you pour, the customer is going to complain that it's not strong enough. So you have to find ways to combat this. And, you know, when depending on what your house pour is, if you're an ounce and a quarter or an ounce and a half, you know, if I've got a nine ounce, you know, uh, rocks glass or, or highball and I pack it to the top full of ice and I pour an ounce and a quarter, an ounce and a half, I only need a little bit of juice left. And when that customer tastes it, he feels like he's getting a great drink. It does. Yep. And you haven't ripped off the staff. You haven't ripped off the establishment. You've given the customer exactly what he's paid for. and he can probably buy more drinks because he's not going to get drunk as fast, which will increase your tip, increase your your profit. So, you know, just little tricks like that are super important to the bar science, you know, of it. The, uh, another thing that I do is I use a wider straw than most people. You know, I, uh, I kind of get rid of the stir sticks. I don't use the stir sticks. I use a shorter, wide straw. And, um, you know, that way their stir stick is a wide straw, you know, and they take a little sip with that and all of a sudden it's gone that fast. And now I was going to say exactly. That'll sell you another drink faster than a stir stick. will. (laughs) that's right. So I literally throw all the stir sticks out at any place that I go to. It's like, you know, uh, and I'll replace the stir stick. It's just a, it's a real fat stir stick. Yeah. Yeah. Not the skinny ones that would come to mind when you call it a stir stick, right? It's got a little tiny hole and it's like, you can nurse your drink all night long with one of those things. That's right. No, if you come to my establishment, we're drinking, drinking, we're not sipping. (laughs) So bad behavior isn't 
always about alcohol because there's certainly obnoxious guests that aren't under the influence of alcohol and they just come in because it's their personality, it's their attitude. So you see both kinds. Yeah, but- we get that in the restaurant side all the time, you know, especially people that complain over and over about the same things or people that are just looking for something free, people that are being nasty and malicious. Uh, mm-hmm. And for me, uh, I will pay the tab and embarrass the customer. Oh, I've, I've not heard of that happening. Very common, but go ahead. Yeah. Because, um, very few and far between. It's not like a regular practice. Sure. Sure. But when it happens, you've, you've, you've thrown everything in the book at trying to fix the relationship. You know, you've, um, replaced the meals, you've comped some appetizers, you brought them a free dessert, you know, and they're still just belittling or, or degrading your staff or they're just an absolute, you know, uh, you just don't want that customer ever to return because nothing about that experience was profitable or beneficial. Everything about that interaction disturbed all the other guests in the dining room, you mm-hmm. know? So, you know, not that those customers come often, but when they do, yeah. you have to, their behavior is drastic. You have to meet drastic behavior with drastic behavior, you know, and uh, you have to show the staff that you have their back and you're Zero not going to allow customers to treat yeah. them like that, you know? So, mm-hmm. um, I'll, I mean, I'll literally go and take their plate while they're eating and say, don't worry about paying for this meal. I'll take care of it. Just leave. Because what else are they going to, well, yeah, I mean, the well, meal is gone and it's you like, know, they're hopefully going to be so embarrassed that they never come back. Yeah. I don't care if they write a They're going to leave immediately and not cause an even bigger problem. Exactly. You know, at this point I'm already taking the loss. You know, I just don't care. I'll, I'll pay for the loss out of my own pocket before I allow that type of behavior to continue to disrupt my dining yeah. room. Right. You know, with a dozen other tables that are all enjoying the quality of service that we have to offer, that are all respecting the, you know, the waiters and waitresses that we have providing the best service that they can, their ability, you know, and um, most people love that approach. Let's go back to something you said earlier. Um, You take it upon yourself to disarm all these problem customers so that the staff don't have to deal with it because clearly you made a point that you don't want to ruin that person's night so that it then affects guest service with other tables in the next couple hours on the shift, you know? I can save the customer relationship too. Yeah. But here's where I'm going with this. Timing is important in any situation. And it is also important that you mentioned and it's common sense that you don't want to negatively affect anyone else this guest's experience around this problem situation. Is it possible or do you, do you even recommend that somehow we train our staff to be the first line of defense and diffuse a difficult situation? I mean, is that a yeah. bad idea? No, no. Uh, I always want to fix it first. Always, 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 no matter what. You know, yeah. sometimes somebody's just having a bad day, you know, and and uh, when you're able to fix it, they'll they'll realize that they had you know, a, a negative interaction and they'll, some, you know, apologize, um, especially, you know, problem customers that you've won over can become customers for life. So for me, yes, I, you're right. That's, that's the other reason why I want to tackle that problem customer, because if I have a chance to win and fix that customer, that customer will never be a problem again. He'll know my name. He'll know my staff's name. We yeah. will have shown him and proven to him or her that we will do whatever it takes to fix the relationship you know, so when you they'll tell other people too, and po- and give you positive reviews and stuff. You're absolutely right. You can turn something around, and that that touches on the lifetime value of a guest. Absolutely you know? huge. And think about if that person now becomes your biggest fan and drives other business to your place. On top of continuing to come in for years and years and years, that is a huge win. Yeah, I agree 100 percent And that's yeah. the other side of why I said I want your problem customer. I don't want your problem customer so that I can go and yep. you know uh create an even more negative experience for that customer. I'm going to go and try to fix it. But I'm also the person that when I try to fix it and it doesn't work, I'm also the one that's going to throw you out mm-hmm. or ask you to leave. Of course. Or not comp your bill. Or you know, charge you market price for all the special modifications that you asked for, you know? So, you know, it just, uh, it allows me to, you know, not have to get a secondhand story of the interaction they had with the waiter or waitress. You know, if I see early signs that this can be a problem customer now, a lot of times, and most of the times when I hop in, 
fix a situation. The customer then is extremely overjoyed and happy. I'll pass that customer back off then to the server, the server, the waiter, the bartender. Mm -hmm. If that problem customer continues to be a problem customer, then I'm going to expo the food. I'm going to run the food. I'm going to put the food order in. I'm going to personally run the drinks. I might even personally make the drinks because I want to be able to combat whatever thing that they're going to say about the drink not being strong enough, the food not being right, the food being too cold, whatever, you know, because sometimes customers that are complainers, they're going to complain their entire experience. I've seen as that. You, yep. As you know. So um, a lot of times when they see the manager, owner, operator take a lead head chef in their service, they kind of stop complaining a little bit because they know that, you know, they watched you personally get the food. They watched you probably personally make the drinks. You know, they know that you're going to be able to combat these things that they might have to complain about. And, uh, you know, uh, and you can take more hard line approaches. You know, if somebody eats half their sandwich and then complains that it was no good, I'm going to make them another half a sandwich. <laughs> there you go. Right. They're not going to Don't get a remake the whole meal. Me. Right. Absolutely. Half a so, sandwich. And know, that sends a message. Yeah, exactly. That's absolutely right. That sends them a message that, hey, you're not going to be able to win with this type of behavior at this type of establishment. And I, you know, and I, I touched on that in the book, you know, um, because scam customers hang out with other scam customers. Oh, yeah. Other, other scam customers. This is how this place reacts to this situation. Exactly. You can go over there and get something out of them, too. Yeah, you're right. They talk. Exactly. So, you know, if they say, oh, girl, I went here and they wouldn't remake it for me and made me pay full price for all my market changes, you know, let's let's not go there. That's a win for us. Yeah, it cuts them off if the that knees. that problem customer <laughs> says, let's not go there because we can't get over, that is a win. So. You know, you've been in this business a long time and we all remember what things were like pre-pandemic. And then we go through the pandemic, which has turned the industry upside down. Do you think that the pandemic or have you seen examples that that really accelerated this bad customer behavior issue we're talking about? Well, what it accelerated, in my opinion, is bad employee behavior. Oh, interesting. Elaborate okay. on that. So I don't think that the COVID ex uh, experience accelerated bad customers. I think because of the lack of staffing support that so many of these staff members have received, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. they are just burnt out. Yeah, for sure. They are, uh, and they are treating customers poorly. And then they want to play the victim when the customer has a negative reaction to their bad behavior. Yeah. And they still so, expect the gratuity, right? They still expect exactly, a good tip. Exactly. You yep. know, uh, if you are not providing good service, you should not expect good gratuity. And that is something that is lost, uh, especially with like the delivery apps, for an example. You know, yeah. I hear so many horror stories with drivers not picking up orders that don't have certain amount of tips or even, you know, berating or belittling, you know, people, you know, for driving a block or two down the street, you know, and they only got. $20 on a $150 order and they should have got 30. So they're knocking on the door like crazy, you know, and uh, I don't have a, uh, an answer for that necessarily either. You know, um, I'm a strong believer in, in tipping your service employees very well. Uh, but I'm also a strong believer in they, had to provide a real service to earn that. Thank you. It has to be earned. And that's the point you're making. It's like, there's a sense of entitlement, right? With a Absolutely. certain generation, perhaps, or just because you're in a service business, you expect it no matter what service you're providing that I'm automatically going to get 20, 22% or even 18%. But if it's not earned, you're absolutely right. And that I should have, send I, a strong message. People should tip well when it is earned and they should obviously send that message that, you know, the service was less than what I expected. I did not have a great experience. So therefore it's reflected if it is in fact the service personnel's fault. Sometimes things happen behind the scenes that they have nothing to do with, but then it's that person's onus to explain what happened. 
you know, and say, I'm sorry, we had a kitchen back up, you know, really appreciate your patience. If you are, you know, if you show that kind of compassion for the guest's experience, and if you do everything you can to give them a great experience, then it's earned, even if things go sideways. I agree a hundred percent. You know, I, uh, I always ask anytime somebody's complaining about their tip, I say, what was your customer's name? That's my first question. Wow. There if you, go. you can't tell me what your customer's name is, then you don't have any reason to complain about whatever tip you left because you didn't even try. You know what I mean? You literally made no effort. That's the bare minimum you can do is introduce yourself and learn what the customer's name is. It's a business of relationships. And hopefully your team are making friends with your guests to give them reasons to return and even ask for you by name. And it all starts with you introducing yourself to your guest by name, right? Which builds that bridge, that relationship. I totally agree with that. I tell my staff all the time. I say, you know how we put a thousand people in this building? One customer at a time. One customer at a time. Because, you know, even though our venue holds a ton of people, Every single person here has a connection to something. People come for people. They're not coming for the venue. They're coming for something that they've had a connection with, with that building, whether it be a past experience, whether it be a bartender, a, a security guy, an employee, you know, the chef, you know, somebody's posted on their social media, you know, whether they're in love with the, you know, entertainment that you have that night. You know, if you're servicing a thousand people, for an example, your staff is probably 40 people, 50 people, maybe. Okay. If 50 people all bring or know 10 people, that's 500 people. You know, that's not a unfair assessment. You're and right. that's, what I, that's what I tell the staff is it doesn't mm. matter that we're serving mass volumes of people. The yep. reason why we built this and we're able to do that is because we focus on one customer at a time. It. And it's not to get lost in, in the sure. volume, you know, just don't yeah. worry about how many people are here. Provide great service to the person that's in front of you and just keep killing it, you know. That goes back to the foundation of our business, which is, of course, that word hospitality, you know, and you either understand what that means or you don't. You either deliver that or you don't. And if you can't understand and deliver that, then again, you're one of those C players that don't belong. You know, it's and really a business of that, relationships. You can have incredible margins. Yes. You d it doesn't have to be a race to the bottom on what what mm -hmm. restaurant has the cheapest appetizer. It doesn't matter what your appetizer's priced at if your customer knows that they're going to enjoy their time there. It's going to be quality food. They're going to be well taken care of. There's not going to be any drama. They're not going to care if your appetizer's $2 more. That's the competitive matter. advantage right there. There's the magic formula. And not every operator thinks that way. But if you do, then you've got an edge over the guy down the street. I agree. I love that. 100%. That's fantastic. So the book, it's called The Customer is Not Always Right. And it's available on Amazon. Any any other way we can get it? Yeah. So um, uh, audio, audio book, uh, AIX, A AUX, um, as well as ebook download as well. Nice. So, paperback, ebook, and audiobook. Well, Adam, it's been great having you on the show. You shared a lot of information and expertise on all aspects of the hospitality business. Yeah, one so more restaurants, quick, uh, bars. Plug. Yeah, please. Did um, I miss anything? Go ahead. Yeah, man. no worries. My my next book coming out is a, a shared experience from uh, restaurateurs. It's called the Hospitality Horror Stories. It's more for entertainment purposes rather than educational purposes. That sounds like fun. And uh, you can get your advanced reader copy at borrowalmighty.com. Just uh, log, you know, uh, register your email and uh, we'll get you an advanced reader copy before it's available for purchase. I'll put that in the show notes of this episode as well, because, again, both books are, are excellent reads. And it sounds like and this new one really sounds like a hoot. <laughs> Hospitality no. horror stories, right? Yes, sir. Awesome. Thanks again, Adam. Absolutely. Anytime. And uh, I'd love to talk to you again in the future. Fantastic. Appreciate your being here. Thanks again to our audience. Thanks to the sponsor of this, of this week's episode. That was the Restaurant Rockstars podcast, and we can't wait to see you again. So stay tuned. Adam, so great talking shop with you. It kind of brings me back to the days when I ran high volume restaurants. We had live entertainment. We had you know, people that had too much to drink. We had complaining customers. It happens to all of us, but you've given us so many insights into how to deal with it and the best ways to approach this problem. So thanks so much for joining us on the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. Stay well. And thanks to our audience, of course, for tuning in. We really appreciate you being there. So I can't wait to see you um, in the next episode. Please stay tuned. We'll see you next time. Listen, I'm all about marketing, but believe me, 
Very few marketing ideas today are fully trackable, where you know exactly where the business is coming from, and you also know that it's generating a positive return on your investment. Now, I no longer own restaurants, but if I did, this idea would be at the very top of my marketing plan. It's all about birthdays. Everyone has a birthday, and they are a huge, let me repeat that, huge source of business in your restaurant. Why wouldn't you want to focus in on reaching everyone with a birthday in your area? Well, you can with the Birthday Club from Fan Connect. Best part is they do everything for you. You get a turnkey marketing system that sends birthday cards in advance, inviting people to celebrate at your restaurant from your area code, plus a sign-up strategy for your existing customers. New business, repeat business, higher check averages, and a massive customer database. You can get all this with the Birthday Club. Check it out and sign up now at getfanconnect.com forward slash birthday rockstar. Thanks for listening to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. For lots of great resources, head over to restaurantrockstars.com. See you next time.